How can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. My name is Heather Stewart Harvey. In terms of creative endeavors, I don't know if you have a working definition for creative, but um, I'm actually trained as an academic librarian and spent a lot of time in higher education teaching 18 to 22 year olds how to do research and really mostly how to ask good questions, which I think is a creative thing to think about, how to be a good question asker. About, I would say maybe six or seven years ago, I started going to the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke, uh, learning how to make documentary films. And I had a background in photography from college, so there's some of the visual stuff was kind of in my wheelhouse, but it was just totally new. I'll never forget that first boot camp I went to it was like two weeks long and it was just zero to 60. Like on day one, you learned how to balance a fluid tripod head. And at the end, you showed your film at a film screening. <laughs> And that was so exciting and so fun. It's so, so technical, but really super creative as well. And so then for like the next six years, I taught college students how to make documentary films, primarily around storytelling, but then also the college I worked at had a big social and environmental justice inclination. So a lot of advocacy films, and that was just super fun. It was like a new way to interact with that age group and that age group loves to make things that they can share and that people can see and talk about. And, and then I want to say four and a half years ago or so, I started making pots. And I, I don't go around every day saying that I'm a potter, but I think I'm a potter. And I tell, sometimes tell people that. <laughs> I know that feeling of you're learning something new and you love it. And then, well, how long do you have to do it before you're that thing? Right. And I, I feel like that about the fiddle, which I usually play in the closet, not in public. <laughs> so I wouldn't really say I'm a fiddler, but then it's been years and years. So when do we say, you know, yeah. I understand yeah. that feeling. I also like the idea of the definition of creative being so open, because really technically, I think you would agree that like almost every single thing could be seen as creative in a, in a way. Absolutely. What did being creative mean to you as a child? Well, I'm just going to say it straight out for the, for your listeners. I don't really feel like I was very creative child. <laughs> I don't remember being particularly drawn to the visual. I didn't, I played the saxophone poorly. I, I had a kind of chaotic resource scarce childhood and I think I was just kind of hanging on and I, I don't mean that to say that someone couldn't have that experience and you know be sketching every minute that they had to themselves but I was a big bookworm kind of kiddo and I think as a coping strategy my mom put me on the swim team and I spent endless hours with my head in a chlorinated pool time I still regret if I'm being asked um, and so like as a kiddo I would never have described myself as a super creative kid or an arty kid by any means. Having said that, I've reflected on this over the years, and I do think that something about being a, from a you know a family unit that was a little resource scarce, I was very attuned to the to the visual, like very um, I noticed things and how things were made and what they were and what they said about a person. And I think that I've always just, yeah, I've always really noticed people's homes and what they wear and not even so much in terms of trying to figure them out. I just had a real filter for it, you know? So I feel like I've been looking at pots my whole life. Like I can remember ceramics from my childhood that I would really be like, I think that's really cool. You know, <laughs> like, so I think I was paying attention to it more in a deficit state than a participatory state, if that makes sense. 
It does. Do you feel like it was something inside of you that kind of wanted that or wanted that kind of environment? Because I feel like, of course, I met you when you were not a kid, but you have a clear, good sense of color, design, choice of clothes, not about any of this being superficial. It's about surrounding yourself with things that make you feel good. And you have that. Do you think some of that noticing was, ooh, I kind of want to live that way one day? I think so. Yeah. I think I would. I felt, you know, I'll never forget being told on the playground one time that this girl was like, your clothes aren't nice enough for me to be your friend. And looking back, I had a beautiful vintage hand embroidered sweater on. And I'm like, none of that makes sense, you know, but it was, I grew up in like a a pretty, I would say conventional mid-sized town in West Virginia. And my family was very different, even if we hadn't been a little resource scarce. And so, yeah, I think I felt like I was looking into something that looked shiny and, and fun. I'm sure I wouldn't feel that way now, but anyway, yeah, I think it was sort of noticing and and having desires. Do you feel like you've been able to meet some of those desires for yourself now as an adult? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, what's so interesting is I'd probably go back to that interaction and be like that really old ratty sweater was the coolest thing on the playground. So, you know, it's like you feel alienated because of your family's values. And I think some people stay in that state, but the truth was I have an amazing original brilliant family. And I live my life very much like they did at that time. I think all of that's a little more normalized having said that, you know, but yeah, all that's been long, long ago worked out. Thank goodness. You know? <laughs> so, yes. Other things that we could add to your list of creative endeavors are playing the banjo and gardening. I love that you're helping me with my list. It's true. I thought about talking about like my home and like insofar as like I'm almost very nesty, married to a very nesty person. We have always grown the hell out of whatever patch of land we've lived on. We finally live in an old house that we love enough to really like put our heart and soul into fixing it up. And so I'm like learning how to reglaze windows and all kinds of crazy stuff, which was really empowering. I do play music. I'm a, a fine backup musician. I play a lot, a lot of guitar at this point and banjo whenever somebody asks or if it's lying around easy to reach. And my husband plays a fiddle and my daughter plays a fiddle and my, my son plays a piano. So we play a lot of music in this house. And, you know, I don't consider that like a driving angst in my life anymore. I'm like the player I am and I really love playing with Ben and I've reached a place where all that feels really comfortable. There were many years where I wanted, you know, things and wanted to be better and did get better, certainly, but like it's a good spot with the music. And the difference between something we might do professionally versus just making a good life for ourselves and just really enjoying it. And, you know, I know in the old time world, there can be that angst is there for a lot of people. We've both experienced it. You're at a festival, there's a great jam going on, you know, you're trying to get in your own great jam and, you know, there's a constant comparing and mixed with just, I just love it. I just love it. I'm always going to do it. And it's a lifestyle choice. And it's not about being the most bestest fiddler in the land. And maybe we could still enjoy it anyway. Yeah. That is really how I feel about that music. I've tried to quit it over the years, but just work because at certain points it wasn't really making me very happy because of what you're describing. And that it's just part of me. I grew up around that music and I grew up dancing to that music. I can't quit it. And sometimes I just hear that music and I'm like, nothing makes me feel like this, you know? So you just play it, you know, <laughs> just make me just figure it out and play it. It's clearly not going to quit you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you think that it's helped having a partner that plays too? Yeah, for sure. I don't know what would happen if I hadn't married a musician. I mean, it's funny. I recently met a couple of musicians here in Maine and they're both backup musicians. They play the banjo and the guitar. So they met Ben and they were like, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, like, so, you know, not having a a lead instrument in the mix, I guess you just learn to play differently, you know, but um, yeah, my musicianship is very much formed around my marriage. And I do love to play with other people when it's easy and it's in the backyard, but I Yeah, I'm pretty much, I'm like Ben's backup musician, (laughs) especially with COVID. I haven't played tunes with anybody in like a year and a half. So (laughs) thank goodness he was there. Good old Ben. Well, we all four started playing together during the pandemic. Oscar playing the chords on the piano. Rhett is a fierce little fiddler. I felt like 
I had to keep it together. Like I couldn't let the kids know how incredibly excited I was that we were all playing this music together or I would just scare them off of it. So, but that has been a delight. For Retta on the fiddle, did she have a day where she said, will you show me? Or was it the other way around? Because it is very delicate how to fold kids in. That's pretty much why Oscar played the piano. We were kind of like, we play music in this family. That's a line that we say a lot. Like music is one of our values that is not optional in the family. We don't have a lot like that. Like, you don't have, you don't have to be on a sports team. You don't have to get good grades, you know, like, and so with Oscar, I, it was clear that he really wanted to play something that was not associated with the type of music that mom and dad play. And so he headed off on the piano and that's been super fun. And then I, you know, with Reddit it was like just a lot of loose talk about like, well, what's it going to be for you? And she decided on the fiddle on her own. But having said that, you know, with the pandemic, we basically ended up teaching both of them. The Zoom lessons were just pretty painful for, for music. And, you know, we're both musicians. So in that role, it was like much easier with Oscar because he had already had several teachers and was a pretty advanced for his age musician. But with Retta still being pretty fresh, I felt what you're talking about, which was like, you kind of had to teach from the side. I and mean, she did have a wonderful teacher preceding this, and now we're back with her. But I think with both of the kids, it was really essential to more than stepping away from the musical style or the actual instrument was to get another person who is not your parent <laughs> involved. I remember in sixth grade, I told my dad, I really, really, really want to play the fiddle. I had that feeling. It's never gone away. But what happened was, <laughs> so he showed me some things and then I got really mad at him because it was hard. <laughs> yeah, because you can. You're allowed to get mad at mom and dad, but you're not really supposed to get mad at your teacher. You just do what they ask you to do and try harder. <laughs> exactly. On your path in terms of how you grew up and being in college and then eventually coming across ceramics and your sense of design and curiosity, did you have someone or a couple of people along the way that you feel like really encouraged that in you or helped you realize you had it in you? Yeah. You know, I got to be honest, I'm definitely still looking for a ceramic mentor and I'm actually kind of cultivating a relationship with someone up here. There is a really cool, like actual paid grant apprentice mentor program up here. And I'm hopeful that this um, ceramicist up here might do that with me eventually. You know, again, I, like I said, I come from higher education primarily and my director at my job there, who I was, I was there for a decade was the person that encouraged me to go to Duke and the person that could help me see how, even though maybe in a casual explanation, it could seem really crazy that an instructional librarian wanted to learn how to teach documentary video, that there were actually real connections there. She was someone I really wanted to impress for the right reasons. She just really encouraged my, um, again, we're using that word creativity, but like even just in how I was teaching students, she really encouraged my experimentation. And when I would lament something about how it wasn't to my desire, she'd basically be like, try something else, you know, which felt at the time, particularly in academic librarianship, really like a permission I wasn't used to. So, you know, despite her, she's not a maker, she's a historian and a library director. I felt like she thought I could accomplish a lot. It was like, I don't know how you're, you know, I'm going to leave it mostly up to you. It was a very independent relationship. She was just like, just show me what you got, you know? <laughs> so it was a mix of seeing your potential from the outside of your own brain. Cause when we're inside ourselves, that's harder to see mixed with high standards and expectations mixed with freedom. So yeah. that's a combination that works for you. Absolutely. It's really fun to think about that because then we could use the same formula on ourselves or like you're saying, you're looking for a mentor in something you're looking maybe for a certain kind of mentor. Like we all kind of jive with a different combination. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny now that you point that out. It's so good because this woman that I've kind of been doing a get to know you dance around potentially being my mentor is really very similar to this previous person I was mentioning. So that's neat. Anything. So we are buddies on good old Instagram. And the other day you posted something that I thought was really interesting. And you described yourself as a woman who makes pots in nothing but shades of gray, but who really loves color. What are your thoughts about why you feel drawn to a modified color palette versus the world you like to live in? And also on your posts, you do photography where you're paying attention as much to the shadow as to the piece. 
the shadow mm -hmm. that your piece casts. Mm -hmm. I'm curious your thoughts about saying a little more about that. That's such a nice question. There's sort of a, a kind of technical answer. You know, the first thing I would say is that I think anybody like initially getting interested in ceramics will immediately recognize this, which is just that like the technical avenues are endless and really overwhelming at first. So there's like the physical technicality and like, are you wheel throwing? Are you hand building? Are you learning to use a slab roller? Those all have deep technicalities to them. And then there's like getting to know your clay bodies and getting to learn to load and fire your kiln the right way for those clay bodies. And then there's glazing, right? Which is just this infinite world of complicated chemistry and how the glazes interact with your kiln and your clay. And I could sense that there was something really strong for me in the world of making pots, but I needed to take some variables out of the mix on the front end. It's like when someone gives you three crayons versus giving you the box of 164, like, yes, you've been limited and yet a bunch of decisions just got made for you. <laughs> and I think I picked the glazing, you know, I don't know how you wouldn't pick any of the other three. So that's really probably why, but I also had a lot of, you know, when I took that first class and started to really finally towards the end, make a few things that had some, some intimacy or some gesture in them. And then I would, so I'd bisque fire them and I'd glaze them and I'd lose something in the shape, you know? And I think it's probably cause I was a lousy glazer and I was using studio glazes. And so even before I started messing with my clays, I just got real frustrated by that. And I just was like, I'm just gonna fire everything with no glaze. Cause I just need to see what's under there. You know, like what comes through the whole process that is something I wanna hang on to. And then I realized I just kind of liked the way those pots felt and that I could see every, there's no hiding on an unglazed pot, you know, which is not to say that people who work with glaze are hiding anything by any means. And to be fully transparent, most of the pottery in my house is glazed and colorful and I love it. So then I just started messing with the ingredients in the clay and I just kind of walked around glazing. I just took a detour and I never kind of came back and it allows my work to be single fired. So most potters do a bisque firing, which is a long, slow firing to mostly fire your pot, but not all the way. And then a glaze firing. And every time I run my kiln, I kind of suck in my breath at how many natural resources I'm consuming in that process. And I figure if I've figured out how to do it half as much, that's twice as good. I don't know. That doesn't really work out. So sometimes I have like run across glazes or some techniques where I would have to do two firings. And I think that's kind of what keeps me from tipping over the line to try again. I'm, maybe I'll change my mind someday, but, and there are people certainly making work out there that is unglazed and does incorporate significantly more color. And I've tried some things. They're all in the closet of to, never to be seen in the, in the light of day again, but it does call to me. Like I said, I love color and I felt like I moved to Maine in the winter. I did move to Maine in the winter, but I didn't feel it. I did it. And it was very gray. And there was like six hours of sunlight. And I was like, everything must be yellow. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to wear yellow. And I'm like, you know, like this is going to be my new <laughs> color manifestation. But so, yeah, it, it, it's a little more passive than you might imagine. It's not like I'm like, I, I will only make pots in this colorway, but I, I just ended up there and it continues to feel right for me. And like you're saying, there are shades of gray. There's not just one gray, you know, <laughs> and also I've noticed in your photographs, one thing that's so appealing, you know, if it's a vase, for example, and you put these very colorful flowers in there, they pop like crazy. They're not mm -hmm. competing with the pot. And then also it puts so much focus on the form. So you're like really watching and looking at the form in a way that's so appealing. I really love it. I love what you do. And I hope everybody goes and checks it out. That connects a little bit to your thoughts on mi minimalism and the use of negative space, because along with shadows, you're doing things where you're cutting parts away. And then like you're saying, there's so many options and choices, which can mean we get overcomplicated or we share too many ideas in one piece. And it's actually mm -hmm. really hard, I think, to be minimal in a way that's appealing instead of stark. So when yeah. you're designing, do you play around and see what happens or do you have a sense of a negative space and where you would want that before you start? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a combination of both. I initially like sort of started making pots 
I will backing up just a little bit. I mostly wheel through pieces for the first several years and then just really made an abrupt switch to hand building, primarily because I wanted to start to work on some of these things. And I had tried wheel throwing. I mean, some people make amazingly asymmetrical work, wheel throwing and then cutting and repiecing. And I think that was a place where I really needed maybe more of a, of a mentor to thread that needle. So I just started hand building and right away I was like, oh, this is, this is where I'm gonna get those shapes that I have in my, the infinite shapes in my brain. And I really was initially just kind of going for pots that, you know, after making so much symmetric round stuff, I was desperate to make something that just didn't look the same way when you turned it, you know? And I realized it as I started to build those that I was, these, they were starting to catch light in ways that just made me super happy. I think it's that visual sort of cinematographer's eye, you know, where I was just like, oh, it's a little darker in that fold right there. So yeah, I think it was primarily by virtue of just wanting to make some pieces that had some gesture in them. That's a word that really resonates for me is gesture. Um, And in so doing started to be more about light. And and I have experimented with some pots that you're referring to where I'm like kind of cutting out shapes underneath or on the side. And I don't know if those will stay with me, though I really regard those more as experiments. But I do find it just so fascinating how, how quickly the eye is drawn to absence And I thought about this a lot in terms of shooting films, you know, it's like, if you cut your interview here, you're almost like, what's, what's down there? You know, you have this, instead of being like, oh, there's a space here. You're like, it's so weird to not see this part, you know? And so you, you, it's a sense of, I wouldn't use the word power. That doesn't feel quite, quite right. But like to, to make a pot and know that almost everybody is, is immediately going to look at this one part of it is really pretty neat. It's like you're guiding the curiosity or yeah. something. I love it. You're a mama of two. What are tactics you use for yourself to juggle wanting to be a present mama with also you have your own life, your own thoughts, your own feelings, the, your own work that you want to do along with like gardening and making food together and all that kind of stuff. It's really hard. I think as a working artist or a parenting artist, or probably just an artist writ large to not feel like you're constantly not getting it done. And I really had to make some mental shifts to like, what is productivity? What is accomplishment? I do think I kind of stopped wheel throwing in part because hand building is a much better fit for dipping into the studio for the 35 minutes. The kids are on the phone with their grandma. You you can hit a coil and walk back up and, and, you know, wheel throwing. I think you could, somebody else could probably figure out how to make that work in 35 minutes, but I, it was just so much setup and clean up. And if you didn't clean up, it would dry and be harder to clean up later. And So it was like, you needed a session. And so for a long time, and this is still true, but for a long time, I was only working late at night after the long, long day of working full time and being a parent and hanging out with my lovely, wonderful spouse. And then I just dragged my sorry butt down into the studio for a couple hours. And so I needed some ways to have other opportunities, but I knew that there were no like long stretches of time coming my way, certainly not in the middle of a pandemic. So I think just the adjusting the way that I made has been part of that. Both of my kids, you know, my daughter was still pretty young when I started making pots. And I remember trying to keep it a secret from her at first, like it was down in the basement. And I told Ben, I was like, just don't tell her what I'm doing down here. Or, and I'm only going down after she goes to bed. So she'll just never figure it out. Well, ha ha ha. You know, and at that point, my son was much older and like you know, it was like of the age where he goes off and reads. And so he thought what I was doing down there was cool, but he's an independent guy. And, but my daughter, who is very visually inclined and always has been, was like, once she figured it out, which did not take long, was like, I'm coming down there and I'm going to be hanging out with you. And this is particularly on the weekends, I would sometimes get some daytime. And she's just turned out to be a marvelous studio mate. She can hold silence. She really learns quickly. She has all her, she has an own, her own studio table and her own gear. Um, And just need, certainly needs help sometimes, but I find that I'm able to sustain fairly long and productive time in the studio with her. And her interest has waned as she's gotten older, but so that was kind of sweet, you know, and I would at times feel guilty and at times, oh, I shouldn't say at times, I have struggled with guilt as I think any parent does when they're doing something for themselves. And I had a friend say, you know, like the opportunity to see your parent do something passionately, obsessively, uh, committedly 
like that's a gift. Like she, she's watching you go for something, you know, that is really valuable as a child to see that. So I've, that's what I try to tell myself when I'm like, I'll be up in 20 minutes. <laughs> you know? Well, definitely. It's like another way of giving them permission to be that way one day. Yeah. Which I feel like, you know, contemporary parenting often focuses on be, like being overly well-rounded, you know, like kids must kind of be good at everything. And I see some parents really getting worried when their kids get really obsessed with something. And I do recognize that that could be a concern or especially considering what it is. But I just feel like as a parent, very interested in helping them follow their passions and obsessions. And if that means that they ignore something else, I'm like totally trying, trying to be okay with that. And also in theory, we're going to have lots of different phases in our lives and they will too. So this flows into the next, into the next. You were talking about the music stuff and kids and my brother did the same where he's like, I want to do the opposite of what my parents are doing. So that was fiddles and banjos. And he was a punk drummer <laughs> and it was really loud. Uh, you could hear him for miles around. <laughs> and then he went to college and people were playing bluegrass and old time. And he was like, what? I mean, he had all the tunes in his head, but he'd resisted it forever. And now that's his number one thing is playing the fiddle. So he came back around to it. So it's sort of like waiting to see where the loop goes for our own kids and knowing that it doesn't mean they never will, whatever it is. And who knows? Another thing that sparks my curiosity, you're talking about, instead of separating having the kid with the thing you do, sometimes letting that overlap Sometimes we need quiet time and just no one around, but I've definitely experimented with just having them in here with me in my studio. And I've also had babysitting moments where it's my kids and two other kids, you know, so I have like four or five at a time and they were kind of small. I'm like, I'm going to take them in my studio. I was very aware because some, two of them were tiny. This could be a total mess. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and see what happens. And I, what I did was just say, welcome to my studio. This is a special space right here. And look, this is the spot for kids. And we're going to take off our shoes at the door. They loved the rules. They knew there was a snack involved. I know I've benefited from when I was young being included in some of that. Instead of assuming that young kids will trash a studio, like one of the mothers after doing that was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you let them in your studio. And it probably helped that I wasn't the mama to all of them because they were listening to me in a different way. So that's another benefit is letting them be in someone else's studio or spend time with other people that are doing those things. And there's no way that it doesn't rub off. And we just, we're not even supposed to know where we all end up, including our kids. So we'll just see what happens. Right. It's funny how often those experiences come down to worrying about mess. I am a pretty tidy potter, but like it's clay, of course it's messy. So it has been an easier, Reddit in particular likes to bring her friends with pre-COVID. There's a lot of little kid pinch pots in my, <laughs> in my yes. kiln. But yeah. And when those little friends grow up, they are going to have fond memories of being in your studio. Is there a maker, musician, creative liver, gardener person of any type of creative medium that you're really loving right now that we should all go check out? Yeah. Oh, I love this question. I am really digging the ceramics of Cat West, Cat with a K. She pots under the name Wisp Ceramics. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Justin Robinson from the Carolina Chocolate Drops. He runs a really awesome Instagram feed called Country Gentleman Cooks. And I've been really interested in following him, not only because of, he, I, to my knowledge, he doesn't talk a lot about music on that feed, but he did an interview with the podcast Uncivil one time that just rocked me to my core in terms of thinking about race and old time music. Highly recommend that whole podcast. It's not live anymore. They're not making anything new, but um, so it's an episode with Justin Robinson on Uncivil that's just amazing for old time. I think every old time musician should listen to that. But anyway, what he's doing on his Instagram, he's a botanist, he's a scientist, and he is doing a lot of really funky and straight on dead ahead look, look at decolonizing botany, which has been near and dear to my heart. I'm a, I love plants. I'm a, a flower woman through and through. And um, I've been teaching the kids about, you know, using um, botanical guides and flower families and plant families. And, you know, laced in all of that is so much colonialism in terms of just what things are called. 
he's often talking about what else you could call it, you know, what else, what somebody else called it. And it's really question, you know, that was actually like a pandemic goal of mine was to teach how to use a, a flower, wildflower guide, you know, and, but paying attention to how, again, how not only colonialistic, but deeply patriarchal, the way that we group and name things and know things is, has been a little flummoxing for me. Um, but and he's like really big into talking about invasive species, but like also the sort of racialized tones of what that means. And um, so anyway, I find his feed fascinating and brings together a lot of things I care about. In moving to Maine, met an incredibly talented painter named Hillary Irons, Hillary with one L. In some ways, that actually has some resonance, I feel like, with your work. It, it's incredibly detailed, deeply bot botanically inclined, and takes me just to that inviting space of the most beautifully illustrated childhood books of your, of your, of your childhood, the ones where you just couldn't stop looking at them and, and inventing as you looked into them. All, you know, a lot of symbolism and spirituality in the paintings as well. So I love her work and feel so lucky to know her. You asked about podcasts. I did mention Uncivil, but I also feel like In the Dark is a really great, it's investigative journalism, one that I found very, very moving, particularly its second season. If somebody came to you and said, I want to make and do, but I'm too busy or it's too hard, or things you tell yourself that keep you going and making and doing and seeing the world that way and that it's worth going for. And it's not going to be very original, I don't figure, but I think oftentimes it's just really about persisting. And I don't know if this is a person that's like looking around for something or a person that is struggling to push through on something that they care a lot about. You know, I mean, on one hand, I would say you can't force it. I am sometimes struck by the difference between how I approached wanting to be a musician during the period of time when I did versus how I've approached wanting to become a ceramicist. And I was actually like a very lazy music student. You know, I wanted it to come easy and I didn't really want to practice. And thusly, I am like a serviceable and unshowy, you know, accompanying musician, right? But like with the pots, I just could not get enough of it. I, it, it flabbergasts me still because sometimes I look at it and I'm like, this is really impractical. You're probably never going to make a lot of money. You're using a fair number of natural resources in the world. You're not saving anybody's life with this gorgeous vase you just pulled out of the kiln. Your work is not addressing systemic racism and deep, deep class divisions in this country. Like I can really talk myself off the hill in a hot second. And yet every night, no matter how tired I'm in that studio scraping away, you know, so there's like information in that. And I've just had to be like, okay, all right. I hear you. I have all these questions and all these doubts. I do not have them figured out. And I'm just going to let them sit there for now and pay attention to how badly I, I want to do this, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And I think that you're totally right that people choosing to spend large amounts of time on some of these things can definitely, there's a list of ways to talk ourselves oh, yeah. out of it. But, it, but then it keeps coming back. Like you're saying, we can't just stop. It's something that's bigger than us. That's important. And then maybe what we should be doing is turning it back around that clearly my deep self wants to do this and that's right and good. And when I do that, I'm caring for myself, which means I'm caring for the people around me, which means I'm caring for the whole world. Yeah. Well, and I think also sometimes like there are a number of ceramicists. I didn't mention them when you asked, cause I feel like they already have a lot of, they get a lot of attention rightfully. So who, you know, over the years of honing their craft have figured out how to bring together social concerns or environmental concerns with the aesthetic, if you want to call pots or painting or fiber an aesthetic, you know what I mean? Um, and that sometimes it's kind of like not glazing. It's maybe you need to figure some things out first before you fully integrate all the things that you care deeply about as a person. Yeah, totally. I'm so happy that you said yes to hanging out with me right now. <laughs> I'm so happy you asked. I look forward to talking to you more again soon. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fain House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards for my watercolor originals, 
I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you'll get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You'll also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If that all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. I'm Annie Fain Barillon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. The more that each of us tends our own soul, the more the world will prosper. Sark. Thank you.